Yes, thank you. Um, it was kind of a, an odd panel just before the coffee break. We were supposed to talk about smart cities, and we ended up talking about the general state of Italy. That was kind of weird, uh, especially because I don't really know a whole lot about Italy. Um, luckily, I can now start talking about something different, and if we can switch the... Yeah. Um, to something I know a little bit more about, and that's opening up data for reuse. Um, when I was invited by Polo to come and speak and we were discussing the topic, we came up with this title, and that's a long title and it was even longer in the program, I think. Um, and it's easy to, to turn this into a very abstract story and make it sort of high level. But in reality, open data is made up out of many smaller, more practical stories. And I'll start with a couple of those to just to, to give you a feeling for that. One of those stories is a Danish entrepreneur who built this service, a commercial service, where you go as a homeowner and you provide your address and then you answer a couple of questions about how you live and your priorities and it provides you with an entire plan on how to make your home more energy efficient. And it provides you with a list of builders in the city who are capable of doing the work that is needed. And it provides you with all the financial possibilities, subsidies, and that sort of stuff that are actually available to you in that position. That's a new service, wasn't possible before. And open data is also uh, about stories like these. This is in Frankfurt, Germany, where for the first time sometimes, neighbors are getting into conversations about things that are happening in city government that are relevant to them. What this site does, it takes all the plans and decisions and the permits and all the stuff that's going on in City Hall and geocodes it for those areas it actually applies to. So you can see here which plans are being discussed that are relevant to your apartment block, to your street, to your neighborhood. And then you can get involved into the discussion and meeting other people also from around your neighborhood and discuss the plans. Or it's about stories like these, uh, north of here in Slovenia, um, they have this platform where all the illegal dump sites of waste materials are catalogued and you can go out and do something about it with your fellow, fellow citizens. Now these are three very different stories, very different examples, but they all have one thing in common and that makes them part of that bigger story and that's they all use as a basic resource information, data, that was collected before for something else by the government that has been published so that others can reuse it. And that's what open data is, reusing data that has been collected for some sort of public task and publishing it in a way that others can use it. And publishing it in a way that others can use it means that it sort of adheres to a list of things, that uh, it's public data, so no personal stuff, no state secrets, whatever, uh, that you do it in a, 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 as quickly as possible. It doesn't make any sense to publish election results one year after the elections. You want them the day after ready for reuse. Um, that it's accessible for all, that you don't have to state the reason why you want to have the data, and that there's no, basically no financial, legal, or technical barriers involved. That's opening data, open data, all the barriers removed, you can reuse it. Now, the thing is, we've already got basically all the laws in place in Europe that make that possible. There's the um, PSI directive, which says every European citizen has to actually the right to reuse government data once it's published. And of course, there's a long list of exceptions there, as governments usually do. There's the Inspire directive that does the same type of thing for geodata. It, the, the Inspire directive is a European directive that says we need to harmonize all the geographic data across Europe so that a municipality in Italy is described the same way as a municipality in the Netherlands where I live. Um, but it has the effect that it also creates a lot of data that then others can use. So the Inspire directive. And there's the Aarhus Convention which says that every bit of environmental data in Europe is public and can be used. So these are rules, European rules, that have been translated into national law in Italy and in every other member state of the European Union. That all happened already in 2003, around the time when we met Polo. And we didn't know about this, we were talking about blogging back then. Um, and since then, it was largely silent. Nothing much happened. And that's because the rules came about because of traditional users of government information, publishers of legal texts, companies who used meteo data, companies who used geodata. 
What changed in the meantime since 2003 is that because of these data sets becoming available in a digital format, all of a sudden, not only the specialists, but all of us could start having a look at the data and think about how we could use it. So it was silent for a number of years, and then 2008, the United States government opened up uh, their data site, and a year later uh, in Europe, the first country to follow that example was the UK. And this is national governments opening up uh, websites where you can find and download data sets. And once one country did it, more started to follow. So you now have Spain uh, with a platform where you can find data. And the Dutch government uh, opened up one for which I wrote the plans. And then it took them two years to get it online. Don't ask. Um, the Austrian government did it. Uh, and it's not just national governments. You also see regions doing this. So especially in Spain, you see very different regions opening up. This is the data portal for the Basque country in the north of Spain. This is the biggest Spanish data portal there is. It's bigger than the national one. And it's Helsinki region. And it's not just regions, but also cities. So Stockholm does it, and Berlin does it, and my hometown does it. And that's not a coincidence, but because I live there. So, I mean, there must be something in your own hometown if you go around Europe talking about this stuff. Um, and, of course, there's also a lot of initiatives already in, uh, in Italy itself. The first initiative uh, by, on a government level was the Piemont region that opened up a data portal, and that's already a couple of years uh, ago. And in the past few months, actually, it was a, a sort of a wave of these type of initiatives starting. So Torino opened up a site. Uh, this is the Lombardia region. Uh, we have Bologna, and you see different government bodies starting to open up their data sets. This is the IMPS, and there's a lot of very interesting stuff in those data sets. And there was a competition, Apps for Italy. Anybody uh, took part in that here? No, no, no participants in Apps for Italy. This was about building applications on top of the data that was already available and figuring out what to do with it. So there's all kinds of initiatives around Europe, and we have the uh, uh, vice president of the European Commission, Nelly Kroes, going around Europe saying, we are going to break open the public sector because this is the new gold, this is the new oil, this is the type of metaphor that she's uh, talking about, and she is pushing the notion that this is of high economic value, releasing all this data. And that's because the European Union is about creating single markets, so they focus on the economic aspect. And if you look at the research, and there's a link to various reports down there, and we're talking about potential economic activity of many billions of euros per year, and, and, and that's why it's part of the digital agenda for Europe, and that's then translated into the digital agenda for the Netherlands and the digital agenda for Italy, and that's being translated into regional digital agendas. So the driving force for the EU is this economic perspective. And there's also lots of proof that there's economic value in publishing this data. These are just two. Um, the, the, the first one is the Dutch Meteorological Service. They started publishing their data six years ago, and um, increasingly opening it up. Uh, since then, uh, the, the amount of companies using the data increased 10 times. So they had about five uh, companies using it, and now it's over 50. Um, the, sort of the turnover of these companies reusing data quadrupled because of using the data. So they increased the turnover. They created 90 plus jobs. And over the past five to six years, uh, they delivered 30 million euros in extra tax revenue to the state. So this is profit taxes and income taxes on the activities based on reusing this data. So there's serious economic potential. This is just one data set. The Spanish uh, um, sort of researched what is being done with the data that we publish. And they came up last year with a yearly turnover of 600 million. That's a serious industry. It's as big as the gaming industry in Spain. And over 5,000 new jobs being created because of this reuse. And that's only 40% of the reuse because 60% of all the reuse of Spanish data is outside of Spain. So they don't really know what is happening there. But these are serious indications that there is a lot of economic potential in reusing that data. And if you look at sort of the complaints for not releasing data, it's usually, well, it costs us money to publish the data. And if you look at the same research, you will see that the cost for the government to release the data is typically much, more, uh, much less than 1% of their operational cost. And the potential in the data, the European Commission says, is about 2% of GDP Europe-wide in total. So this is a social and economic 
uh, direct and indirect impact. 2% of GDP, that's serious stuff. So they are going to change the rules because they like this. So there's a new PSI directive being discussed in the European Commission that increases the scope, so the types of data that fall under this direct uh, directive. So they want to include cultural data. These are the metadata collections of musea, uh, uh, photo archives that are held by the state, that type of thing. You will see that the new rules will move toward a, a position where it's less voluntary to publish data. It will be become more uh, mandatory for government bodies to publish, proactive publishing. Most of the lo laws now are passive publishing laws. You can go and ask and then you probably get it. But there's no proactive publishing going on. And basically they're saying access to information is the same as being able to reuse it. And we're going to call reuse open data. So now we have a European open data strategy. That's new. And they are leading by example. So they're opening up a data portal of their own this year. Next year, they want to aggregate all the data portals that you just saw so that you have one access point in Europe for all the data. And then they want to turn that into an open data service infrastructure. I have no idea what that means. Uh, but they have until 2020 to figure it out. Um, so you could say that we've already won. I mean, this, this sounds good. You know, there's a lot of stuff happening. A lot of governments are opening up the data. Uh, we're seeing economic results. Uh, but still, it seems as if we've only just begun. Because if you look at the sheer amount of data that government bodies have, we haven't even barely scratched the surface. They published some things that were easy to publish or convenient to publish. They certainly didn't publish anything that might be dangerous to themselves and their positions. No, so there's a lot of data still out there that, that is unused, and it's an enormous abundance in these times of uh, austerity and scarcity, if you believe the newspapers. And all the initiatives are also very fragmented. There might be a data set describing the labor market in my town, but not for the neighboring town. There might be one big data set by the Ministry for the Interior being published, but I can only use it if I also have access to a, a data set from the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And if I don't have that, I can't make any interesting combinations. So it's still very, very fragmented. And it's e basically, there's more data not being released than there is data being released, even though it already feels like there's a lot. And that's because there's also lots and lots of different barriers. So you don't have to read this. It's just about the colors and the sort of the clusters of that. Um, there's diff lots of different barriers if you want to start opening up data. There's also lots of barriers before you start opening up data, and those are the excuses to not get started. So we're different. Everybody else should open up their data, but we're different. We have an exemption. Uh, where's the business case? It will cost us. People will get angry. Yes, of course they will. Um, but there's also a list, and that's this list, of actual barriers you will encounter when you start opening up data. And it's not just barriers in the sense of technical things, financial things, and legal things. Actually, those are the smallest clusters. The biggest clusters in these pictures are the one on top and that cluster here on the left. None of the things, none of the barriers in there are about technology, about rules, or about money. They're all about government changing from being scared to wanting to try this out to be able to uh, figure out how to do it and how to implement, overcoming their fears. And it's, the other big cloud is about us changing, being able to access the data, having a look at it, finding out how to interpret it, finding out ways of using the data in our own environment, and maybe in the end also build business models on it so that we can sort of create viable economic activity using the data. So there is a transition going on. We have a new resource. Most of us don't have the skills to do something with this resource. Most of the data holders, government bodies, don't have the skills to properly publish all that data in a way that we can reuse it. So we have to learn as we go along. And that's why a lot of the things that are being done right now are finger exercises. Nobody is yet really piano playing. We are doing finger exercises. These are basic applications being built, and we're sort of learning as we go along, and we do it together with public sector bodies. And that means that right now, building networks and building communities and building places where you can meet people and exchange your experiences and collect ideas and, and feedback are the main fix of overcoming all those barriers. And that's, uh, what you see here in the picture, the guy in the middle is the, the project leader for the Dutch National Data Portal. 
And this is at a hacker convention, and he came there, you know, handing out T-shirts. And then the guys in the blue shirts are from different other ministries. One is from agriculture. He has a shirt, farmers data. And they were there to engage in conversations with the hackers and the coders about what type of data would be useful to start publishing that isn't there yet, and can you help us do that? So they reach out and start conversations, even though that these are typically not the civil servants that normally engage with the public. They're on the inside of organizations. These are new conversations taking place. And this is the main fix currently for moving forward. There's the law is not being proactive, uh, implemented. There's some pressure from above, and there's a lot of trial and error from below. And I spent part of my time at the APSI platform, which is the European website, uh, full uh, open data, let's say, uh, where you can find lots of examples from what's happening in different countries. Because it's not just connecting locally to government, it's also knowing what other people are doing based on the same rules in Bulgaria. And I don't know how to search in Bulgarian, and I don't really know how to search in Italian, so I need a place where you can find examples all in English, and then once you know it's there, you will be able to dive in and find more out uh, about it. So we've only just begun. Network building, community building is currently our, our sort of prime strategy for moving forward. And we need to keep building momentum. And there's various ways and in, in, in various directions in which we have to start building more momentum. It's not just about building apps or building websites, we have to start moving beyond that because a lot of the potential seems to also be in things like business intelligence solutions, which is not as shiny and sexy uh, because it doesn't look very cool, um, but uh, it's, it's useful to a lot of internal processes. And we also can move through to things like ambient displays. This is a guy in London, as you might have guessed by the bus, uh, because it's Travel London, and um, he wanted on his desk a notification in how many minutes his bus home arrives every time it passes by the office. So he took a data feed from the London Public Transport data that gives him the number of minutes until the next bus for him to get home, and he built that into a bus, a toy bus, and put it on his desk. This is also a useful application, even if it's a small one, of uh, reusing data find out how quickly you can get home. But you can also, beyond apps, think of data as something to turn into tangible products. This uh, was created in Switzerland a, a month or two ago. These are statistics printed with a 3D printer into plastic earrings. Or you can simply eat your own pie charts. So there's, you, know, you have to escape this notion that everything should be an app. There's lots of other places where data can be used. It can, can be used to inform decisions and can be used to things. And the same thing is not just about economic gain. It's not just about building commercial applications like uh, an application to find parking spaces in the middle of Dublin. It's also a tool, opening up data, for entire different things. It's not just economic gains, not just transparency. Um, it's also a way to open up entire sectors that are notoriously closed. This is the International Aid Transparency Initiative. And what's happening here, I think, is on a global scale, the most exciting open data project, even though it's not very uh, sexy. Um, what's happening here is that donor countries, donor countries who provide international aid, publish all the data about where they give money to. Then the NGOs who receive that money publish all the data about the projects they spend money on. Then the receiving countries publish data on how they have their own plans for certain regions and how they make use of the services of NGOs and how they are spending money. And then you have local uh, civic organizations who publish their information on how they check up whether local government is spending the money correctly. So this is an entire chain where everybody is opening up data. Now, to all of them, that's a risk, because for the donor countries, there's lots of discussion. Is sending money to developing nations, is it of any use? There's a pressure on their budget. The receiving countries are usually blamed for corruption and those type of things, so there's a risk to them all. But there's also a gain for them all, because donor countries use this to actually enter into the discussion about the usefulness of, developing, uh, of development aid. Receiving countries are using this to get budget security because they sometimes don't know for 10% of their national budget where the money is going to come from next year. 
because they don't know about the decisions of the donor countries. The NGOs need to find out whether they are the only one building a school in a region and not three other NGOs doing the same thing. Receiving countries want to know about building a school so they don't have to build a school but can build the road to a school. And civic organizations want to battle corruption and want to make sure uh, the money is actually well spent. So they all have something to gain. They all have a different agenda here, but they can address it by opening up all the data in their chain. So this is an entire sector making an effort to make itself more efficient and working better. And this is not about economic gain. This is not about transparency. This is about creating results, like we discussed beforehand. And increasingly, you can start discussions with your own government about how publishing data is actually a policy instrument to them, a way to save money, a way to increase participation, a way to measure impact in the actual data sets that are being tracked anyway and not doing some zero-point measurement and a one-point measurement afterwards. And also, government is the biggest reuser of government data. Most of the data from a government body is being used someplace else. And by opening it up as open data, they make all of that easier and sort of uh, diminish transaction costs. So this is actually a very good policy instrument for government bodies itself. And I would blindly take the challenge from any government body in the world to build their internal case on using open data as a uh, policy instrument. And so that's me applying for tasks, not jobs. Um, but at the same time, you see that beyond economic activity and that sort of thing, also, so, so new public tasks are emerging on top of this data because the data is creating a new space in which you and I as citizens can have conversations with our government. This is from Stockholm, where they said, OK, normally we plan our culture budget by fixing it to certain expenses a year in advance. We're going to do that as well, but part of our budget, we're going to open up for ideas of citizens. And the platform, what the platform does is that you go there and say, I want this rock band in town. And I will pay 100 euros to, to, to have that band come. Or I want to see this exhibition in the local museum. And I will pay 50 euros towards that. And then they use the city budget as a lever, as a way to multiply the money that citizens are willing to put up. So this is a new type of interaction between me and my government, because normally you would go through the whole political process of sort of, uh, sort of deciding on the budget. Now, certainly, we have a place where we can do it ad hoc in a specific context for a specific thing. And the same goes for things like these, waiting lists in the healthcare sector, another Swedish example, where by having the data available, we can have a different discussion about how we use our own healthcare system. And it's also about self-empowerment. This is Wheelmap, started in Berlin. This uses public data about public accessibility of buildings. Where can you get in with which type of uh, wheelchair? And it started in Berlin, and it's actually propagating across Europe. So now it also has the, uh, the real-time status of lifts in the Viennese underground. Because if the lift doesn't work, you can't use the underground. And you can find that out on Wheelmap. And this is self-empowerment. If I am in a wheelchair, I can make my own decisions and plan my own trip much more flexible than I could be able to do before. And it's about journalism. It seems that journalists have found their, re -found their purpose in life uh, when it comes to using data. Because all of a sudden, you cannot just find stories in data about the functioning of government. You can find stories in the data about all aspects of life. And these are not stories you're just sort of transcribing from the, uh, from the wire. You're creating your own. And a lot of it is in, in these types of visualizations. This is a map of Vancouver uh, where parking tickets are being issued by the parking police. And then what happens afterwards is not just that people say, OK, uh, maybe I should park over there on the lower right because they never write any tickets there. But also the police takes a look at this and say, well, may maybe we're too often in that street. Maybe we should go to... You know. So you're also creating new feedback loops on how our public services are working and how they are functioning. And that is all about participation, and not this type of participation, where you get invited by a government body at the start of some de decision-making process, and then you talk about it, and you have sort of uh, the speakers like I am doing now pontificating on stage. Um, and, and then they decide it, and they create the policy, and then you don't recognize anything in it from what was being discussed uh, before this process will happen. But it's part participation as actual life, as you and me living in our own neighborhoods, simply being an active part of your own society. And there, 
data can inform you in a different way. Of course, you have information about where you are and what you do and what, how you live, but the data sets describe the same type of things on a whole new level of, of, of uh, abstraction. If we know on a city level what is happening on that level, you can apply that to, the, to your individual personal situation. Then that's very different from just the information I observe when I walk around my town and I have to make my decisions. So participation is life where data becomes the object of sociality, the object around which interaction occurs, about, around which new connections, new relationships can form. And the most simple example I can give of that is this. This is on Twitter. Um, so it's not for everybody, but what's happening here is quite interesting. The United Kingdom government published all the laws as data in a way that you can reference each section and each sentence with, with its own URL. So every little piece of legal text in the UK has a web address. And what's happening here in Twitter is that people are commenting on something and they are directly referring to the law. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but I never, just for pleasure, read a law. I don't do those type of things. Because you don't know where to look, you don't know how to find it, and you can't really quote it or use it. But all of a sudden, if everything in every law has a separate web address, I can reference it. And I can say, you know, you're saying this, but according to me, if I read it correctly, it's entirely different. So these are laymen discussing legal cases in a way they would never be able to do and would never have done before the data was being released. So data is becoming an object of interaction. We are forming new conversations, new relations around that. And it's about to get bigger because it's not just government that has a truckload of data about our lives. This is a, a picture of all the linked data currently in the world. Uh, these are data sets that actually point to each other so you can sort of navigate the entire cloud, and only the green stuff on the left here is government data. All the other stuff comes from someplace else. Companies, stuff that we create, Wikipedia for instance. Um, so there's much more data out there that also has something to say about where we live. And there's lots of sectors where we would like, as an individual, know more about uh, because they hold data that is relevant to our lives. Banks being one of them, for instance. But banks also have an, an uh, um, uh, an interest in actually publishing a lot of data because they invest in all kinds of different sectors and markets and publishing the data into that market actually is an intervention again just as publishing data for government is a policy intervention. So you can actually open up pretty well discussions with banks about opening up the data and some Spanish banks are already doing that publishing data for you to reuse so that you can actually better keep track of what's happening. Utilities are another one, electricity, gas, water, that type of thing. And here in Italy, it's ANAL that is already uh, opening that up. And it's not very impressive what they have published, but it's a first step. And at first, it came with the wrong license. It was not open. It was closed. You couldn't really use it. But they changed that. I mean, it's a first step in the process, like us, they are in the same type of transition. Uh, but this is a good start. And you could think of healthcare and uh, sort of um, insurance companies who have lots and lots of data that describes a large part of our lives that we could use to better inform ourselves and make better decisions. In the Netherlands, most of the healthcare data is, uh, that the state has actually comes from insurance companies. And they attach conditions to it so that even the state can't really reuse the data. Even though healthcare is the biggest expenditure that we basically have in the country. So we want this data from companies. And think about your food. There's lots and lots of data about our food chain. If you buy in the supermarket a, a, a sack of pre-cut vegetables, mixed vegetables, they, the data is there to tell you from which field every piece of carrot came and which field every piece of zucchini came and they, because of their quality control systems. They can trace the entire chain back. Now, that data could also serve to change the relationship between farmers and consumers creating fairer prices for farmers. So there's lots of places outside of government where we would find data uh, that is of interest and could actually help us address the very complex questions that we grapple with. And of course, there's our own data. There's places like this, COSM. Uh, previous, previously, it was called Patch Bay. Here, citizens share sensor data. And they share data that they collect. And you can go there and reuse that data. So it's not just government. It's also us, and it's also our companies that can share. 
And the thing is, if you have these massive amounts of data, what do you do with it? How do you come up with worthwhile uses for it? And that's something that Evo said. Um, I see the time. I, I know, Paolo. Uh, that's something that uh, Evo said in the panel before. You have to start with an actual problem, an itch that you want to scratch. And you may not have the data skills to do it, and you may not have sort of the web skills to do it, but you have to start with a problem and then start addressing that in your own sphere of influence. First the problem, then the data connected to it, and then finding new ways of doing something. And you don't have to really change government to be able to do that. You don't need to change the banks to be able to do that. You don't have to start out with changing the system. You only need to find one guy that has a sympathetic ear inside that system who is able to help you. This is my one guy in my hometown, the guy in the blue shirt. He was the first connection I made to local government. Together we created examples that turned into something that politics was interested in so that they were starting to apply pressure from the top and that allowed us to create more examples. It started with one guy. So you need to go out and find your guy or woman in a blue shirt and start the first conversation so that we can start using that abundance that is there. It's there for the taking, it's been paid for, it's there, we can reuse it, and we can use that to create resilience locally in our complex world. So let's get to work. Thank you for your time and attention. The slides will be online, and of course you are allowed to reuse them. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome.